Bob, you were, in effect, recruited, I think, by Edward Teller. Mm-hmm. I have a friend who's listening to the show this morning as we speak, uh, believe it or not, all the way down in Perth, Australia. His name is Stan Dale, and he was also recruited by Edward Teller. And he's got a question or two for you. I'm going to see if we can bring him up. Um, uh, all the way from Perth, Australia, there's a slight delay in the phone line transmission. Uh, Stan, are you there? Uh, yeah, Art. Okay, very good. Um, Bob Lazar is on the line, and I know you followed the Lazar story, and you might briefly, just very briefly, recap yours and ask a question. Uh, all right, very briefly. Um, I was working um, in the computer business in Dallas in 19, oh, I think it was 70, 71. And um, I, among other things, I was also uh, doing some investigation for the FBI uh, at the corporations where I was working as an undercover um, kind of plant. Mm -hmm. um, during this time at this company where I was working, it was a, a large um, uh, corporation. It was called Valtex Optical at the time. It had 100 uh, subcorporations. And a lot of them operated in Nevada. And um, during the time I was there, I was approached by one of the senior executives of this company to go meet with a doctor, uh, James R. Maxfield, at the Radiation Research uh, Clinic over uh, a couple miles from where we had the office in Dallas. And I I didn't go uh, for about a month. And then um, I met this same executive at a, a morning coffee uh, in the uh, executive tea room. And uh, he said to me I hadn't been to see his friend Maxfield, and the reason he'd asked me to go is because I had talked to him about some work that I've been doing in my time off, my private time at home, in my own laboratory, working with two things. One was a thermionic um, electrical converter, and uh, the other was a rather novel method, I thought, of propelling a you know, flying uh, aircraft, uh, which was uh, circular-shaped and, you know, flying saucer, you'd call them today. Mm -hmm. Anyway... Uh, in the course of having told this guy just over coffee, well, he kind of got reasonably interested in it and told me I ought to go talk to a friend of his and didn't do it. So 30 days passed, and he says to me, look, you haven't been to see Jim Maxfield yet. Please go this afternoon. I've booked you an appointment at 3. So I go over this place, and it's not like a place that sees people very often. It was um, it was open. Uh, the door was kind of ajar, but there was no cars in front of it and, and daylight. And um, I walked in. The lights were off down the hallway, and I walked down the hallway, and it was kind of dark, and this suddenly this nurse, uh, well, I guess a receptionist type lady, appears out of nowhere from the side and says, yes, can I help you? I said, oh, gee, I didn't know anybody was here. Look, I, I think I've got the right building. I'm looking for this Dr. James R. Maxfield. And um, she said, oh, yes, the, uh, Dr. Maxfield is here. He'll be out in just a second. He's down the lab. And so, sure enough, within a minute or so, this big, tall dude comes out in a white uh, you know, medical coat, smoking a cigar and wearing cowboy boots. He says, ah, yes, yes, I've been expecting you. Come on into my office. And at this time is when I first got introduced to uh, this clandestine uh, organization in the United States that was headed by Dr. Edward Teller and who Maxfield worked with, uh, with, with uh, Teller. And this organization um, had been working since the mid-50s on something like 50-some-odd projects, all related directly to um, flying saucer technology, if you wish to put it down to that level. Um, I was just the, the latecomer on the scene. They showed me about their uh, base down at the South Pole and the ice cap. I had to access it by submarine or something similar. And um, they explained to me they knew what I was doing. They even knew what I was thinking, virtually, because they asked me about my physics. And I said, well, look, thinking I was talking to some of the greatest physicists in the world, which, which I was, um, I didn't have my degree in that area. And, uh, you know, I said, well, look, guys, um, or sir, you know, I... Um, uh, been working on a way to to unify gravitational, electromagnetic, and, and magnetic effects. Uh, and he said, "Oh, look, spare me all that." He said, "You're working on anti gravity, and let's get to the, to the meat of the matter. How are you doing it?" And that's when they started, or when he started telling me um, that I need to finish my research with them down in Australia instead of America. And that's why I'm here today, is because those guys packed me up and sent me down here. Hmm. We parted ways um, in 1970. Two or three, I think it was. I was only with them for about a year. And uh, I got rather um, disenchanted with all the technology they were holding back from the people. I still was young enough to think uh, that we could, um, that we could uh, save the world by giving technology to uh, you know, countries that needed food and grain and water and stuff shipped back and forth rather rapidly. But uh, anyway, because of that, we parted ways in a, in a 
real huff, and um, I kind of hid in the bush for a while because they, they really kind of thought it would be better if I was buried. And then uh, after coming out of that, uh, I wrote the book, The Cause of Conspiracy, to kind of be insurance and told a lot of what I had gone through in there and left the rest for, I'll tell the rest if you get short with me. So, uh, now that's my side, Bob. Hmm, that's a did, did you ever run into Ma- story. Did, did you ever run into Jim Maxwell at all on your side of it? No, I haven't. Actually, well, now you, <laughs> I've got a thousand questions now, but one of the uh, uh, a prominent one on my mind here is what what function... What was Teller's function? Was well, he, he seemed to be in charge or overseer of all the projects uh, at, at the highest level. That's all that, that I was told. See, this is something I've always wondered about the project down down where I worked, and uh, you know, no one really ever spoke of him. But I got just a gut feeling that he was silently in charge of everything, and uh, it's. Well, what you're saying is also very interesting because uh, a lot of what uh, you're talking about seems to mimic some of the things we were working on. Uh, and In fact, Bob, when, uh, if I remember right, when Teller called you, when you originally got the call from him to uh, contact the gentleman at EG&G, Teller said that he was no longer active but worked in a chief That's consultant right. capacity. That's right. Uh-huh. Something happened after I left because, in, in fact, I'll tell you, uh, I, I had uh, minders appointed down here who really run this country and, and run the prime ministers. My minders operate out of a group called the Melbourne Club, and they're, you know, the old kind of British Raj, you know, uh, cigars and port uh, white-haired guys. <laughs> anyway, they brought me into their halls of power, and I had lunch a few times with the, the kingpins there, and, and my my mentor was uh, mm, Sir uh, John Williams and... Um, uh, Henry Somerset, Sir Henry Somerset. Anyway, we were sitting there one day at lunch, and they were talking amongst themselves about someone moving in on them, or they were like, like a, uh, an undeclared war status, and that they were losing. And they never mentioned aliens or all that kind of stuff, so so don't jump the gun. But I, you know, I heard them say, "Well, yeah, Henry, it looks like um, we're going to lose this. You know, they're they're just moving in." And and I waited, and nothing else was said. And I said, "Well, excuse me, gentlemen." I said, uh, "By they." You know, thinking I'd be clever, I said, you mean the European Economic Community? Because we've been talking, you know, large corporate uh, or, or money deals in the, in the country. And they both looked at me like I'd, you know, done a route at the table or something and said, oh, hmm, maybe we'll do some fishing up the farm this weekend, Henry. Yes, John. And, you know, immediately I knew that I asked a question that I should have known the answer to already and didn't. Anyway, they they indicated at that point that they were being taken over. Well, I got away from the organization and wrote the book and all that. Years passed, and about seven years ago, I have a friend in, in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, named Conrad Murphy. And Conrad goes uh, to a lot of places. Uh, he's a, he, he races uh, boats and uh, cars, and he's, he's you know fairly active fellow in business. Anyway, Conrad is invited to give the morning devotional at, a, at some big business breakfast, like for the you know Arizona 500 Club or something like that. And and so he rang me. He says, "Look, guess who I'm going to give." The the you know the breakfast benediction right next to who's sitting right next to me uh, next week is is you know Edward Teller and I said wow I said can you get to Mr. Dr. Teller and say you know take a message I want to talk to him he said uh, not a problem so I waited and waited and the week passed and so Conrad rang me back and he says wow he says well I sat next to him and he said you know it was all kind of you know normal conversation give the benediction eat a bit and he says after he had a couple of bites I said to him look um what do you know about um, uh, this fellow named Stan Deo, you know, down in Australia working on anti-gravity and, uh, you know, uh, flying saucers? And he said, Teller looked at him very blankly and said, don't know the fellow. He says, oh, that's odd. And he reaches in his coat and pulls out a copy of my book with my photo on it and turns it up in front of Ed Teller. And he said the, the blood drained out of his face. And he looked away, and a general over on the side who was in uniform came over and took Teller and said, Dr. Teller's got another meeting and took him away. So... I wondered at that point whether Teller was in charge of anything anymore. Do you see what I'm saying? Hmm, I do. That's very so we, interesting. We, I've never been able to get back to the team. It's, uh, you know, I think they did lose. Whatever, whatever was trying to take them over did. And so anyway, uh, after all of that, Stan uh, had to sort of lay low for a while, and he just sort of ended up staying in Australia. Well, Art, uh, I had to give up my U.S. citizenship to keep from being extradited at the time that they were trying to, to get to the bottom of this, okay? 
I'd love to be back in the States. Were they trying to prosecute you for, for anything? I mean, what was... Well, I wasn't sure like how there's it was a, going a to lot go. Of the story because, sorry, sorry, say again? See, that's a delay we have. Oh, I... Sorry, my fault. Uh, no, just go on. It just what, what what was the reason? What were you? Uh, were they trying well, were to prosecute no, you for? Uh... There were a number of things, Bob. One of them was that. Oh, there were a number of things. Oh, jeez! Can I just put the dog on? She wants to say something here. <laughs> just a second. I don't know. Um, the uh, as I said to you, I was doing some undercover work for the FBI, and and they deny, of course, that there were seven hundred of us doing. Oh. <laughs> it's a, sorry, cl- it's we're, a we're clear we're dog from Australia. Believe me, it's coming through very clearly. <laughs> These are the most popular dogs on the planet. They've seen a bird out here, and they're trying to eat it. All right, well, the, All the, right, question, no, no, no. the question is, uh, Stan, w- were they trying to prosecute you, or were there threats on your life? How serious was both, it? Both. Um, when when uh, I went underground, they, they had really determined they were going to put me underground permanently in, in uh, Melbourne. Well, we so as that a result, much. I ran, and for a little over a year, I... I traveled in the Australian bush with, you know, let the hair grow out and wore the sunglasses and uh, traveled with the hippies and whatever just disappeared. Uh, finally, I got hungry and had to come back in. And uh, when I did, I came in under an assumed name and worked for a while. And uh, But eventually they caught up with me because I applied for work in, in companies and had to show my passport. Uh, when what I was did, the, I, uh, can I interrupt you for a second? What, sure, what was the threat that you presented to them? Well, um, were they afraid of the information that you had, or yeah? Or, okay, yeah. so that that was their main concern that you were running around with information that you you could possibly divulge to someone else. And well, first of all, I would be able to identify them. I mean, I could identify you know like by name the people that were head of it in in the the um, um, aeronautical research center at Fishman's Bend in uh, Melbourne and, and uh, in the uh, Australian Club, who of course control the prime ministers of this country. And there was a number of things that I, I was privy to that would be rather embarrassing. But in their defense, let me say this. Now that I've had time to think about it, if I'd have been in their position and uh, they were holding the secrets they were and were under the pressures they were, I would probably have ordered my execution as well. Um, it, um, it, it's bigger than one person's life. It's, it's a really, I'm sure you would appreciate this, Bob. What we're talking about is a cover-up of incredible proportions. Were you able to continue your research, or did they have all the requisite hardware? Oh, of course they did. I, I did do some. I, I did play around a bit what I could do, but um, you know I couldn't. Do, I didn't have access to high temperature uh, coating. I couldn't put my barium titanate or anything else on on, on the uh, the capacitive surfaces. Uh, but your little that, that video you did with the little ship that had the thermionic converter on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know why you had to have an element uh, whatever it was one one fifteen. Because uh, we were quite aware that you could convert um, thermal energy uh, at around 37 um, um, gigahertz uh, on, on the on the sampling frequency, you could you could take random heat and convert it into flowing electric energy. Uh, well, that's making... the thermionic generator. I mean, yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, oh, and, yeah, but all that does is that. Yeah, that's just uh, that's just providing electrical power. That's correct. That's correct. As I say, we didn't need 115 to do that, though. Well, yeah, no one does. I mean, that's how, uh, yeah, I mean, space, uh, space thermionic generators just use, uh, you know, plutonium to warm, uh, essentially, a, you know, a, a thermocouple using a, you know, Seebeck effect or whatever to, uh, produce, uh, you know, electrical energy. However, the, the basis of the craft that I worked on, the electrical energy was merely a byproduct. That was not how the entire craft operated. That's where the 115 came in. Now, the, the other thing I noticed here is you were using gravity wave A and gravity wave B uh, focus uh, fields. Mm-hmm. Um, in the stuff we were working on, it, it, um, the field we would generate was in a, a toroidal field that would curl. Well, around that's, the a, that's exactly how this was generated. It was essentially in a torrid uh, around the craft. Ah, oh, okay. Um, in fact, there's. I just have some. Um, some of the animators uh, gave me some fantastic graphics that uh, I haven't really been able to post anywhere, but I did want to put them up on the web somewhere because there are a lot, a lot of people that are interested in the actual propagation of the gravity field, and I was just about to uh, uh, give those to the guys that uh, uh, handle our web page, and uh, you'd be, uh, it might be worth having a look at that. What's the uh, website? 
Uh, it's it, it, look. Uh, Is Stan, it on your just, yeah, just go to my site and you'll be able to jump right over. Stan, we're out of time in this half hour, but what okay. fr from what I've heard, I think that you two should be communicating. I know. Well, I never have been able to reach Bob. He kind of did like I did, went to ground, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, what I'll do is I'll provide Bob with your number in Perth. Okay. If with, your, with, with your permission. Is that all right? Fine. Excellent. All right. Nice email, talk to you, Bob. Email might work well, too, eh? Yes, it does work well, and we can make those arrangements as well. So. Well, that would be fine. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, talk to him. All right, Stan. Um, uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll put you two in contact. All right? Good night. All right, good night.